This is a really cool chat. A good friend of mine, Robert Miles, is here. Um, and I think it's uh, special to be here and share the story with you because it's been a journey for both of us together. So, you know, I met Robert when he was working on a, a unique project at General Motors. And uh, it was called Maven Drive, and they really wanted to bring, I won't speak for you too much about it, a kind of this digital consumer experience to cars, integration with other, uh, um, you know, Uber, Lyft, et cetera. Well, you want to tell people a little bit about that project and what it was like to kick that off inside of a big behemoth company, General Motors, because I think Maven's really indicative of the kind of breakthrough projects that are happening in, in big clients today. Sure, James. Hey, everybody. So um, Maven was really the, or is, really GM's entry into car and ride sharing. And uh, it came at a really interesting time for the company where we really need to reinvent and change the brand and address uh, a lot of concerns around competitiveness and what was happening in transportation industry in general. And it was the first consumer brand in over 20 years, really the first one since OnStar launched. And so it was a huge transition, both from a system standpoint and a, and a way of thinking standpoint and, and really a, a cultural one that drove uh, an immense amount of change and, and really was the impetus for our, our relationship to start with Pivotal. Yeah, and I, I remember specifically the first moment my brain really activated about Robert's point of view. We were in a meeting room at General Motors and he was saying to their cloud team, if I can quote you, if we use Pivotal, we've tested it, and it's 1,600 times faster than our existing process. And I was like, the specificity and urgency behind that statement is enormous. What, what was it like kind of coming into GM, trying to go fast within existing kind of what you might call pre-transformation IT? How did that feel? Uh, well, the, first, the first year was pretty rough, um, to put it mildly. You know, we would have, uh, you know, we were in a model where it would take you know, six months to get a database, you know, three months to get, uh, you know, a server provisioned. I mean, I, which now seems kind of absurd time to time frames, but at that point we're, we're pretty normal. Well, I mean, I think let's establish what normal is. Normal is what I would call like the yearly cycle. You know, like, hey, we're gonna do a project, we'll kick off this project, we'll plan it, and then, you know, over the course of a year, we deliver that project. And so every component is sort of within that year long cycle, and I think, your team really showed GM what was the art of the possible. Yeah, I mean, we, we started out and, and the aggressive organizations were, were uh, really deploying quarterly. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when we, f when we have first kind of out of the gates with Pivotal and our first, first release about three months after we set up the platform, we started deploying uh, about, uh, I think we were pushing a, a thousand times a month. A thousand times a month. Yeah. From four yeah. a year. For a year. So. Yeah. That, so I think the thing that is so amazing about this is that people started to notice that, right? Like the, uh, other teams were then asked like, hey, I like this experience as a business leader The working with Robert's team seems like fun. Like why are these other teams not going slow? And I tee that up because sometimes we have this idea of bimodal IT, which I do not like and I think is over and should end, which is the idea that you can have the new digital team go fast, but like every, every other project can continue on at its slower pace. Well, it's a great point and that's how we really started out. And, and I have to admit that we kind of used that to our advantage for a little bit because um, what it allowed us to do in, in the early days was um, convince everyone that we had to work in a different way, right? That we had to be able to move faster, that we had to be able to innovate try new things, and that was really not compatible with the way that the IT organizations were set up already. And so initially, we went down that path, so we had different policies, some di different policies and requirements, and uh, different obligation and, and responsibility for ensuring we met the, the core objectives of the company, even though we were doing things differently. But as, as things started to evolve and we had successes, we started to have a lot of the other traditional, more traditional parts of the organization. I mean, even manufacturing and, and other groups that you know, came forward and really wanted to start adopting the same kinds of uh, approach and, and tooling. And then, then we had to kind of fight that, that 
across that chasm as far as the difference between the two modes. And in, in his kind of looking back at it, um, I think we would, we would take a much more holistic view and you know, all the way from kind of the top of the stack from an application standpoint through infrastructure and DevOps. And we did a good job, really good job of working with our security teams and in, in, in invest, you know, injecting their requirements early in our process so things were automated, um, which made a huge difference. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's totally fair to have a team start to work in a new way, have, have freedom and to do bimodal early. I think I just don't really buy it as a long-term vision because inevitably, if you're gonna start to do profound things for customers across your business, it's gonna affect your whole business. And yeah, and I, and I think it sets up, sets up some kind of unhealthy um, organizational I think Robert just Hello? lost his mic. The back, there we go. Uh, it sets up some some unhealthy organizational tension, right, between the, the the cool kids that get to do whatever they want and everybody else that has to do things the traditional way. Yeah. When you're really trying to drive cultural change across the entire organization, because that's that's when you really start getting the benefit. But I think the cool thing was the other team started to be asked to go faster too. Like, in a, in a sense, that was. <laughs> Like, hey, why can't you deliver the features as fast as Robert's team was a refrain I heard oftentimes. It's true. Um, and I want to get kind of that dynamic. I mean, there's some upsides to that and some innovation, you know, some impetus for the organization, which was good. And we started spending a lot more time working with other parts of the, the company to help them, help them succeed and help them accelerate. Yeah, one thing I, I think if I remember from those times that I really liked from your team was you talked about... The, the new operations team for the platform and uh, everything around it really was about enablement. And there was this one amazing quote from an individual that says, I used to come to work and say no, and now I come to work and say yes. And if, if you could bottle up kind of the movement of IT change and transformation, I think actually almost that phrase alone is, is pretty darn close. Yeah, I mean, I, there's, there's a couple, couple pieces to that. I mean, one of the, we can took four, I kind of look at it from four perspectives, right? Or four big pieces of the initiative to drive culture change and transformation and acceleration around um, software delivery. And uh, you know, a fundamental piece was really shifting from a culture of control, especially for services organizations, to one of enablement, right? So their focus is really on how do how do I say yes in a way that meets the needs of the organization. And the, and the requirements, whether it be regulatory or whatever. Uh, so that's a big dimension. Automation throughout, right, is absolutely critical to driving to, you know, CICD, which makes the whole, whole process work. And then the other fundamental shift for the support organizations in particular, but kind of company-wide, was a shift to um, really from a project orientation to a product, product view of the world. So things that are ongoing, evolutionary and require, you know, day-to-day -day care and evolution and, improvement. And, and I think that, I mean, how many people in the room are thinking product to project? Like, I hear that everywhere I go, right? Like, that's, that's kind of the big theme these days. And I think that's part of this enablement culture where you're constantly enabling the teams to keep delivering versus being uh, essentially watchers of a process to say this project's approved or not or funded or not. It's, it's continual effort together and enablement. Yeah, and I think the, uh, one of the pieces that's kind of been evolving for me lately, especially in kind of my new role, because I'm, I'm you know, at a new organization now, and, and we're on the, you know, it's the second time through parts of this journey. So, so where did you end up after, after you were very successful at General Motors, and how did you get there? <laughs> uh, so uh, I'm at uh, J.P. Morgan Chase now. Uh, so it, it's fascinating because it's a completely different business. Um, in very, very different requirements, uh, obviously, uh, and, and incredible scale. And I think it shows how important this change is, is that anyone who's mustered a little bit of talent and uh, track record at delivering this, like the market demand for you all is just through the roof right now. If you can tell the story and execute on this not just bimodal greenfield, but fundamental transformation, like I think the sky's the limit. And, and maybe, Robert, we could riff a little bit you know, a lot of the banks do use the pivotal approach 
and security is one of those reasons. Do you want to talk a little bit about how you look at transformation and security? Is security part of that? Yeah, the um, security is, is yeah, obviously critical in, in our business, but um, you know, across, across everyone. I mean, the, the security landscape has changed so much over just over the last couple of years. And you know, I, I come from a long history of um, extreme programming and agile, kind of like you know, pivotal. That's one of the big, big attractions you. for me. Um, and the, you know, the, the whole shift left kind of perspective of how do you pull you know, those kinds of requirements, um, you know, security, testing, all of those things as far to the beginning of the life cycle as possible and build them in so that every day you're ensuring that what you're developing and what you're deploying and, and releasing to users is not, not just works well and scales well, but is secure. Yeah, it's almost like the same phenomena you discovered when, you're, when your more agile team was doing pipeline-centric continuous delivery for, for Maven 1,600 times faster. If you go to a CIO and every CIO's board is asking them more and more sophisticated security questions right now, you say, well, what if we could deliver updates and fix vulnerabilities and recreate our system 1,600 times faster? How much harder of an attacker how is an attacker you know, getting after us in that world? The, the whole strategy that you guys have been pushing around the dynamic updates and re, repaving and recycling and you know, the you know, your fundamental kind of 3R perspective yeah. is, is, I think it's in, um, you know, kind of world changing in the way that you view how you secure systems and, and the way that you can build them. And I think there's even a, there's a side effect to it just around resiliency, right? It, I think the entire concept of having development teams be able to deploy weekly or daily or whatever the, the scenario is um, you, you can, you cross, it can cross across or should cross all kinds of different dimensions of the business, especially security. Yeah, I mean, I think what, what's happened is that we, we, start, we used to start on projects like Maven or you know, JPMC at Asset Management, the new portfolio manager. It's, a, it's, a, it's an incredibly important new digital assets being developed. But what happened was people realized that the operating efficiency and the security efficiency of a platform-based, more continuous delivery approach were also orders of magnitude different. So we have clients like T-Mobile where they had an operating team of 220 people that went down to six people with everything they were running on the platform. And that's where people go like, wow, this isn't just some fancy new ideation thinking. Like we're really becoming a different business because of this transition. So I mean, that's maybe talk about your new job at JP. Like you now are confronting their $11 billion a year spend and like how do we get that to cloud native? That, you know, that from an infrastructure standpoint, there's interesting challenges. And I think the, the, the big one in my mind every day is, you know, how do, we, how do we make the developer and engineer experience, you know, the best in the world, right? How do we, how do we make it so that people love what they do and love how, they're, how they can build and what they can accomplish really quickly? And, you know, even, even just within my org, that's, you know, 4,000 engineers. Um, and so it's, it's a different kind of scale and the way you have to think about that and a, a barrier to entry that makes it approachable and easy and safe for people to do their best work. But isn't that, isn't that really back to the, your original insights around culture of enablement? Like isn't that when you start thinking of a platform as a product uh, of your, 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 your fundamental projects as products, it's all about enablement and experience and speed of iteration. Like those are all very much connected across that. Yeah, enablement and, uh, you know, I, I tend to use enablement. I think you, in a lot of cases you can substitute in uh, empowerment. Yeah. Right? I've, don't let me misquote yeah. him. Like whatever, I, it was close to that quote, I think. <laughs> no, I don't think, you know, you, you had the right word. Um, I was so inspired. I was like, I love this quote. <laughs> I feel good about my job. You know what I mean? Like when you're like having a day and like someone's using your product and they're like, this is awesome. Um, <laughs> But I, you know, I think so often in, in large organizations in particular, people feel that they can't move, right? They can't influence the world. They can't, can't get done what they, you know, they're being asked to do. And, and I know, you know I, I told the story to, to part of your team about one of our um, engineers that was really focused on DevOps. And early on in the process, he, you know, after um, really right at the beginning of the, the journey with Pivotal and before we'd gotten 
really anything implemented yet there. You know, he, he came to me and, and said that, you know, that he, he just couldn't do it anymore. That he came to work every day that, and had to, had to disappoint his team. He had to tell the customers no, he had to tell the development teams that he couldn't do what they asked. And you know, in, in brought up the issue around how long it took for provisioning, how long it took to stand systems up, and that you know that he he just couldn't take it, and and he quit. Um, thankfully, we we were at the point with uh, real, you know implementation of uh, of PCF that we were able to convince him to give us six months to to stay, and with the promise that we were going to put do everything we possibly could to fix those problems. And you know, I've been gone a month now, but last I heard, he's still there. You know, two years later. So uh, that's a fantastic story. So. Uh, you know, I, I, my perspective is that be, because like business delivery, operational efficiency, security, and then maybe one last thing, which is multi-cloud choice, are all in this same paradigm. Like, wh how do you think about in the in the cloud world picking partners, and is it all in on one cloud? Like, is is multi-cloud? How do, how do you think large organizations should think about that? You know, I'm, I'm sure it's different for a lot of different organizations, and I'm, I'm still trying to figure out my new one, so I can't really speak for, for them. Makes but, sense. Um, but I think, you kind of universities, you look across, you know, what's, what's happening in the industry, and, and the, way my look, the way I look at it, and the, one of the great things I love about Cloud Foundry is that it gives, in, uh, you know, an uh, abstraction layer across, across those clouds. And one of, the, one of the things we did right at the beginning uh, when, we were, when we were working with your team was the first week we were doing a POC to stand up Cloud Foundry to, to figure out how, fast, how much faster we could go. To get 1,600 to times. I'll never forget <laughs> that number. You, you do love that number. I do too, actually. Um, and, uh, but, one of the, we, but we had problems getting our internal system stood up, yeah. right? Back to the provisioning problem. We had almost everything in place and somebody had missed a set of firewall rules, right? It took us an hour to flip and deploy to AWS. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's what's interesting is that like keeping a platform, be it ours or another one, that's really focused on end user delivery, you know, that, that really is of the essence and moving the clock speed of the entire organization across dev security operations to something more weekly and not just thinking about cloud as a new infrastructure rental model. Like, I think that's where, like, you and I were worrying last night over a drink. Like, thinking of this at too low of a level is almost a huge distraction. Maybe we'll close on that. It, it definitely is. I mean, the ability to have, a, have an infrastructure that the developers don't have to think about every day and that you can dynamically shift or, or expand capacity across clouds and have a transparent model to that is incredibly powerful. And I th that's, that's where, where, as an industry, we have to go. Uh, and, and the specifics of one cloud provider or another, I think, are not nearly as important as how do you deliver business value across, across your company. Yeah, yeah, that's just something I observed, like every enterprise is being visited by every cloud salesperson in the world, and I would just then encourage them to talk to people like Robert, who've really done meaningful project delivery um, and transformation in size large scale enterprises. They haven't just sort of rented servers, they've really thought about how they transform, transform fundamental speed and you know, delivery architecture. So it's just been a privilege to be on this journey with you, Robert, so great to be here today. Privilege for me too, and congratulations. I, I don't think Solstice could have picked a better, better partner of the year. Hey, we're excited to work with Solstice, great to be here, thank you.